Welcome to The Third Space. This is a show we talk to innovators and tastemakers from all around the Bay Area. Why The Third Space? Well, outside of the home and office, the coffee shop is The Third Space. We ask our guests to take us to their favorite coffee shops where we have amazing conversation over coffee. Hi, my name is Faiza Farah and I'll be your host. Our guest today is Christina Wong, comedian, performer, artist, and actor, most known for her one-woman show, Wong Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. My mom came back from Amsterdam and was like, let me show you the magic of these cookies. And my mom taught me culture. <laughs> and it just it just fits over it. We give it a couple minutes. It's, this is not um, on the go. This is very patient. <laughs> a healthier afternoon snack. This is not healthy. It's got <laughs> wheat flour, tapioca syrup, palm oil, cane sugar, water butter. Chickpea flour, eggs, sugar, molasses, sea salt, oat fiber. Like, this is not a healthy <laughs> soup. Compared to fuel. what? Like, <laughs> crack cocaine? Exactly. Uh, were you going to do crack? <laughs> no, have a wafer. <laughs> it's healthier. It's healthier. It's healthier. <laughs> it's healthier. <laughs> Are you going to eat concrete and <laughs> suck some cock? No. <laughs> have this wafer. It's got palm oil. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna drink a Coors Light, smoke a cigarette, then eat the cigarette butt? No. <laughs> Healthier snack. Butter and cocoa. And I'm emphasizing the er. Healthier. <laughs> like, everything is healthier. <laughs> exactly. Everyone could justify every bad habit is healthier than something right. else. Right. What is this? How did we put this on top? We put it on the top of the hot, so it comes not warm in the middle. It's all crisp. And I think if you didn't know what this was, you would just eat this alongside the tea. Right. But it's specifically shaped the same size as a cup so that the steam from the tea comes up and loosens the middle, <laughs> jellies the middle, and then you have this sort of warm, soft, syrupy wafer that you eat with your tea. Fantastic. You want to take a bite? Yeah. yeah. So. Ooh. Oh, this is good. Oh. It actually worked. What do you typically order when you go to a coffee shop? Um, this is my first time in a while doing handmade spicy chai, which is what we got. <laughs> yes. Um, I usually do tea. I don't drink coffee. I, yeah. uh, when I was in high school, I had no time management skills, so I would just take caffeine pills and try to buy myself hours <laughs> to study and do homework. And that created really, uh, I became really aggressive <laughs> because I had no sleep and I was like kept up on caffeine pills. Like there's this episode of Saved by the Bell where Jesse Spano yes, I gets, uh, starts taking caffeine pills and they have an intervention. I'm so excited. Like that was me every day. So like no, excited. Jack Morris did not climb through my window and help me. So pretty much through college to be honest, I haven't drank a lot of coffee. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to start kind of talking about your work yeah. and um, how you came to your work. Well, I grew up in this city, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Happened to be home for the weekend. Um, I'm, I'm third generation Chinese American, so my grandparents actually came here as immigrants. My parents were born and raised in the city. And um, I think there's like this stereotype of like a tiger mom and like really strict upbringing. And I think some of that was true. But I think a lot of my upbringing was also very San Francisco. And I sort of describe growing up in San Francisco as a Chinese American as living in two different worlds. Like one that was sort of like the Chinese family side being intensely conservative and very values driven and very success driven. Mm -hmm. And then being in this like free, at least then pre-tech, you know, right. here pre-tech boom, it was like very free love. Like a lot of my friends were had hippie parents. Um, uh, but I also had a lot of Chinese American friends, um, and uh, and like sort of like there'd be things like the Folsom Street Festival and things like this that existed, and like wild pride parades that existed in the same city that I was growing up in, which felt you know very conservative, very um, family oriented. Uh, guilt was a huge thing uh, in my life. Um, feeling like a failure was always something that ran huge. So I think for me, I found my way into performance because it was just like an outlet to just feel like I could be something that wasn't um, 
Like what I do now is so, for a living, is so different than anything I even knew existed mm -hmm. when I was growing up. If you told me that I could grow up and be on a stage by myself, talking about stuff that no one in my family would ever want to talk about, like sex, like uh, like race, like uh, like mental health, like I would be like, are you kidding me? That's a job, that is a real job. Um, that I could be dressed like a giant vagina doing stand-up or, or having funerals for uh, the white man's penis, which is what I did a couple <laughs> weeks ago at the Mocha in LA. Like I had a big six-foot phallus and we did the whole funeral I because saw I saw patriarchy it. suddenly ended, you know, which Yay. can only end in a museum. Uh, <laughs> like I chose the, the least Chinese profession, but I went about, go, you know, the business of it in a very Chinese way. And that's why I'm still doing this like 10 years later, like full time. I don't know if that really answers the question, yeah, it totally but, does. but uh, yeah, I first got into just doing plays and most of them were written like by Neil Simon, by all white men. So I was just sort of playing characters that were really written for white people. Then I got, went to UCLA and had this whole like, whoa, about my gender and race identity. And I never been taught to think it was okay to think about or question things before. Wow. And I joined an Asian American theater company that had its own politics because yes. <laughs> we were sort of the blind leading the blind. It was still also very male driven, right. but it was a starting point for me to begin to think about issues more critically. And uh, I was really actually influenced by Chicano theater and, and how that work uh, organized farm workers and to see sort of intersectionally how that community talks a lot about their politics in parallel ways that Asian American, the political Asian American community can talk about identity and, and class and whiteness and things like that. So I've made five solo shows, uh, some seen more than others. <laughs> uh, made an ensemble play. My first project out of college, which people who are my age will know of, is called BigBadChineseMama.com. It was a fake mail order bride website, and that's how I actually started my career. As I was getting taught in different classes, and I would literally like invite myself to, into the classes so that I was. Uh, being taught at, and I was like, let me give a talk. Like, you know, I don't care if you have an honorarium. I just like was just trying to establish myself as an artist, and then I sort of built a reputation as a speaker, and would start to introduce my performance work slowly. I mean, it was it was a haul. I never had a full time job, had part time jobs in the nonprofit sector that were full time hours, and right. definitely nonprofit pay. And I sold stuff on eBay for a long time in my twenties to make really? money. I mean, it was just like I wonder, like how how you decided to kind of keep at it and not quit, and and what yeah. your parents' reaction was oh, when you were God. like, I'm going to, you know what, mom and dad, <laughs> I'm going to be a performance artist. I know that was crazy. I I joke that I ran away from home at 23 because I couldn't talk to them for a while because yeah. it was just so stressful that I was afraid of going home, and for many years. It wasn't until I was like 28 and made my first show, Walk Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was really successful. I got a Creative Capital Award to support it. I saw that it. one. And um, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and I, it wasn't until I got that award that I began to actually feel like a real person. I just, I, I, there was an intense sense of failure every time I came home for the holidays and I hadn't booked a big commercial or had a book published and I was just still in that trying to be and I, my advice for young artists is, is to not let the fact that you don't have a big project define that you are a real person or not. I know it gives us so much pride to have had a show or a a thing that that had major significance but it, it really was rough for me especially because to come home and then you see everyone you went to school with and they all make all this money and they seem to be doing really well and are getting married and having kids and I'm like barely starting a career like I, re I really would say it wasn't until I was 28 till things began to move along in a way that felt um, I was able to just have like a living wage like right. at that point before that point I was I was selling things on Craigslist I still needed I remember having a heater and I sold it for eight dollars just because I just needed eight dollars right. you know unfortunate that I'm not in that position anymore yeah. but uh, but I will not forget that that's what I came from I guess what kept me going is I'm, just, I'm really stubborn and <laughs> I had many moments where I was like I should just stop just go get a job for a few years right. and save up and that actually would not have been a bad idea mm -hmm. to have done that but I just was so moved and inspired and idealized the lives of performing artists that I saw them while I was in college I saw them touring and, and, saw and who them. were those people? Um, I remember Denise Uehara mm -hmm. who is a solo performer she, she lives in Arizona now okay. 
but she did a lot of solo shows and she toured internationally and had residencies and her work was so exciting and cool to me and I was like that's I want that kind of life and I felt like the work that I made early in my career was very much about catharsis and was a very it still is to a point but it's a it's a lot about moving a certain uh, I've never found been able I've never had a good experience with a therapist and I feel like I don't I want to say the work is very therapeutic it doesn't replace therapy but there's something to be said about taking yeah taking these ideas and putting them somewhere else and making everyone watch them (laughs) now later in my career I've learned like I can't just deal with all my issues this way like I can't just put on shows and the truth is the people that I in my mind that I thought would be the people who wronged me they'll they'll never they don't care they move on with their life right they don't care what the hell I'm doing and then what happens when like you're not in that energy space anymore and you're not in that feeling but you're having to perform it and yeah. kind of reenact it and relive eight it. Eight years of touring one floor of the cuckoo's nest oh my so it's really hard, right? Because it um, it was a very difficult show to make. It was about depression and suicide yeah. rates in the Asian American community. It was so difficult to make. It was very difficult to have the people I cared about there at the show and some of them feeling like they failed or that like here's our you know here's our daughter here's our loved one like talking about how it screwed up. and it was it, it took several months on the road to shape the show it was like over two hours long when it started wow. and it wasn't totally scripted it was somewhat improvised and it got it now it's at 85 minutes wow. so like it wasn't very it's funny when we started um <laughs> i said we me, me and my persona christina when we started wasn't very funny but it got there over time, and I was very fortunate to have so many opportunities to work it out. When, once I got it to that really nice place, and it felt like I have taken this issue that no one will talk about in my community, that I have not known how to grapple with, and I've made it really funny, and and, and have, have sort of brought a lot of other people that I hope have been struggling with how to talk about this and, and bring them into it. Um, but then touring it three to four years into it, when I don't feel like doing it any, anymore, when my body has changed, when my memories have changed, when I have to keep entering the same 85 minutes again and again, it wasn't fun. And there are times it was very lonely. And I felt like I was Peter Pan. Like I refused to grow up while all my friends, you know, and thanks to Facebook, every day is a high school reunion, right? <laughs> you, I could see them with their marriages and their kids. And, right. and I here I was living the dream, but I was basically reliving the same 85 minutes again and again. I was becoming a character on stage. Like there like it's a little seamless. Like it is a performance, but it was becoming unclear where I was if I was growing anymore as a human being. And when really you're reenacting <laughs> these these scenes, are you creating memories and, and, and living I'm condensing so that you can, memories? Uh, like I had this conversation with another solo artist, my friend Scott, who's a transgender solo performer. We were talking about how sometimes our real memories of that moment shift because we have to plot. We have to make a turn, you know, this memory into a plot uh, and remove a lot of the details right. or the specifics right. because we, we're just trying to drive a greater point through. And I think that is ha- that happens with a lot of my shows. I remember now more the version I'm obviously performing again and again. It gets into my body and an and, and audience takes it home and reflects it back at me. Right. I've had audience members afterwards go, so were you hospitalized? Really? And I was like, actually, no. But like, that's something that they interpret from the show. And I'm like, oh, this is, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So I was really struggling with figuring out who I am. And I mean, a lot of that is how I ended up saying, well, I'm going to go do some, I, I, I can't imagine mining my life anymore for stuff. Especially if I have to live with a show for up to eight years, I feel like, I need to treat this like graduate school, and it's not that um, the shows won't be about me in some way, but I want to just learn about something I, I wouldn't understand at all, and I, I, that's how I ended up in Uganda <laughs> for this recent show. Uh, Before you yeah. tell me about yeah. your, because I want to talk about yeah. the Uganda experience of what led you to go there and, and this new yeah. show, um, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about feeling a sense of like being a failure and feeling yeah. a sense of shame because I think that happens to a lot of like immigrant children yeah or first or second gen where it's like they have to make good on the promise yeah. of 
this country to their parents and if not yeah, talk about that you know mm-hmm. um, I know for me my my uh, one, uh, my grandparents on my mother's yeah. side owned a butcher store in the mission my other grandparents had a laundry right and, and they worked really hard so that my parents would not have to do that so just, I would not have to do that. My parents worked really hard. They, they put me through, I went to Catholic girls' school. I was great, I'm middle class, you know. Um, and so there was, especially because my mother is an accountant, it, it was like this intense, intense sense of failure that everything like has always broken down to common sense numbers. Right. Like artists I know spend three years on, or more, right, on a show that if you add up all the money, they maybe made three cents an hour, right, right on making it. Um, some of my projects are have gone into the negative, right, and right. and it that feels frustrating just from the way I was raised. Like, how do you make money? How do you so so who's supposed to subsidize your ability to make that money? Me, like, because I have a job, like you know. So right. so the, this is very Chinese, or, or or maybe a lot of people just aren't in yeah. that world. Um, it doesn't make it right but it's also uh there's also the sense of my grandparents worked this hard and now i'm going to make less than they made when they came here you know it was so so intensely i just felt so guilty like i was betraying right. that their work and their hopes yet really i felt like i was i was trying to capitalize off that position that i was in that i was going to try to do something different because i believed that i could shift um, the way pers- people perceived uh, women and women of color and um, and, and and Chinese Americans, like I felt like I that, that my work could have. This is not to say I, re- I purport to represent everybody in my no. show, yeah. but but at least that I could offer an insight that was not there before, and also that I knew that once it got going and was working out well, I could feel very satisfied right. in it more than if I was just working for some company making a lot of money, which would be nice, but I think there'd be a part of me that would feel very empty. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think our, our parents, our grandparents work really, really hard yeah. and, they're, and, they're, and they're trying to survive, right? And I think we have all of this like capital, all this privilege, mm-hmm. and with that, I think there's a responsibility to, to make some kind of an impact, you know? And, and, and sometimes it's like parents want you to be doctors and lawyers or engineers and, and, and that somehow validates their work, you know, mm-hmm. their life's work, which is like making sure that you are okay. No. But I think if you are brave enough, no. then you can actually use that, all of the hard work, all of that yeah. love that they gave you mm-hmm. and really move beyond just surviving and really have yeah. thrive somehow in your life. And I think there is something that needs to shift with the culture around art and, the, and right. the, is, is that there is this like trope of the starving artist and, right. and why should we pay for that because it's not as necessary as a doctor and, and there's a certain truth to that. And then there's some people who think of artists as being these people on television who make a lot of money on a TV show like actors who make a lot or some, someone who sold a painting with flies on it for like a Damien Hirst that made, sold a painting oh with dead flies for a yeah. quarter million dollars or, <laughs> and, and like why should we give money to that like right. there's just like this artists are so misunderstood and how they should be valued and then resented if they are valued right, right. Uh, and, and there needs to be a shift in understanding where the arts play like I have seen with my own show that it was filling a gap in certain communities where there was not a conversation around mental health right. where they where there would be campuses where there was a suicide and they couldn't just be like hey everyone let's talk about this because no one wants to walk into that I mean some people do but it just seems just so intense so it's easier to go into a comedy show where, where one person at least me is willing to sort of be very transparent about how hard this problem is to at least open the conversation that way so you don't feel like you're marked as a crazy person right. for going to an event about this topic. One of the main reasons why I'm really excited about you and your work is because you really play with, you engage at, with things that obviously lots of people are afraid of, but in a really, like, by performing through it, you uh, you expose some of the hypocrisies and the the sexism, the you know the the, the viral video of yours of, of you being asked a question about being like you mean this, the one on Fusion where um, a statistic from a dating app right. revealed that that men overall 
because in this world we're all straight <laughs> men overall uh, of the four races that exist right only four races in Duh. this world uh, <laughs> preferred dating Asian women to any other race and and like I think black women and black men got the, the smallest response right um, rather than interrogate that they bring the creator of the app who's this white guy and me uh, to talk about this and on the whole what ride over think when they booked mm-hmm. you to come and talk they to found you? me they I think they found me because I'd been doing uh, I'd written a blog about uh, that went viral and basically you reignited my <laughs> career yeah. that, that, that's what it took was a blog not like four one woman shows like I don't give a shit about that they don't care about labor they care about blogs it was called Nine Whack Things White Guys Say to Deny Their Asian Fetish mm. and that actually came out of a specific frustration with the way I was experiencing white men and white people talk about race mm. um, in ways that disregarded that there is such a thing as privilege and uh, uh, it actually came out of a lot of frustration from the way I witnessed one guy that I had been dating for. <laughs> was talking if you about, ever think about the people that you date in the past, who yeah, you want to see? Uh, <laughs> they can talk about people. Um, but uh, the, the Zimmerman verdict, uh, right? And and he was a white guy covered in tattoos, and he was like Asian fetish guy 2.0. Like back in the day, Asian fetish dudes walked around supermarkets dressed like ninjas and, and spoke really loudly in Japanese to get your attention, and uh, it was so outright creepy. So here was this like spell fashionable guy, metal nine, but like every one of his exes was an Asian woman. Uh, and when did you start seeing it? Like you're like, like he, oh he's a nice guy, we go on some dates. Yeah, like, and, and then you're like asking him about girl. that and he was just like well, don't you have a white fetish? Well, well, well I'm like, no, oh. that, that's not <laughs> oh, the same God. thing. Because you are of the dominant culture. I live in the dominant culture, which I'm constantly being pulled into. How can I fetishize the dominant culture? Right. And I think it also, it implies that we have the same history and the same level of experiences and marginalization, and you can just talk about it equally. So he had posted something like, Trayvon was shot because he was black. I could have been shot because I have tattoos. And I was just like, how can you equate your ugly tattoos that you chose to have <laughs> to being born black? Like that, I don't know that experience, but I know oh. it's not the same as getting a lot of ugly hipster tattoos. No. And I was so angry. In, in general, and I'm seeing it happen online, is that we need to, uh, like people of color cannot just like cling to the black experience as our experience to make our case. But because there is not a lot of presence otherwise of right. our issues, like it's, the, it's, it's a very obvious Right. framework but it's obviously not my experience not right. the same experience right. it's just different so a lot of breaking down this Asian fetish thing was not just going off about white guys and the fetishization of Asian women it was just just going off about the way the sloppy ways in which they talk about race and and to go off a little bit about like privilege and and how uh, I met just meet guys who are like I don't have privilege I grew up Poor. I got teased as a kid. Right. It's like everyone got teased as a right. kid. Right. Yeah. So. So what are you? What are you working on right now? What is the current project? Yeah. So we talked about it a little. Uh, I after touring some very autobiographical works for many years, especially uh, Walk Over the Cuckoo's Nest about mental health. Touring that for eight years, I was like, if I'm gonna have a life with the show this long, I don't want to feel like I'm just mining the inside of my head for the next eight years, and I feel like I'm not growing. Right. That's fine for an essay that I write and I can just whoo, send away, but if I have to physically enact it and think about it this much, I often just think of a big broad idea that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and I was like, I'm going to do a show about the economy, oh, maybe global economics, maybe global poverty, and then that got me to Uganda, northern Uganda, Gulu, northern Uganda, the site of the Civil War, to work with a microloan organization. and. When I got there, my third day, a few things I realized very quickly. One is I, uh, I'm an Asian American woman here. Over there, I am a Mzungu. I'm a white woman, and that was like really hard to react. <laughs> you know, to be like, like wait, what? What? <laughs> um, but there's a lot of relative truth to that in the sense that uh, I had a lot of privilege in that situation, and. And was acting kind of very naive and dumb. How did that trip manifest into your one-woman show? Well, I didn't even think... 
I, I, you know, I'd imagine that I would be doing a show about economic theory and and sort of how microloans work, but there was no way I could do a show about going to Uganda without acknowledging what it means to be an Asian American with no blood ties, as far as I understand, to that continent, and what that whole trip means, and how much I had to unprogram from my head. In America, whenever someone goes to Africa, it's like on a rescue mission, or a charity mission, right. or a safari, right. and it's so dangerous, and it's so scary, and I think that needs to be unpacked before we even get up to, into economic theory. Like, right. this idea that this is such a scary, chaotic, uh, horrible place that needs, that only we can help them. That, uh, that, that one billion people are sad, and we're the brave ones for right. going to visit them right. for three weeks. Right. What's that about, right? I'm really glad I had that experience because it takes a lot of movements around black lives here and helps me understand just how tricky it is. Like it can exist in theory, but like we, when going through day-to-day -day interactions, I think we have to be able to just be willing to move through it. Even if we're gonna make mistakes, acknowledge we're making mistakes. Sometimes it can get really defensive, I mean, <laughs> but, but like also being able to hold people, right. which is, you know, I, th I know I understand a lot of folks are short on patience. I am, and I'm, I'm not even getting the worst of the brunt of shit. But uh, but not being quick to just uh, take, take them down the hashtag war. This right. is hard because right. I those internet trolls. Because I'm a troll sometimes. <laughs> I am a troll. But um, that's a lot of what the show is about. It's like I start the show with me in the armchair in America, literally in the armchair, flinging out handmade hashtags to sort of show how ridiculous like these fights can get. And then just saying, this can't be my life. Right. I have to do something else. Right. I go to Uganda and then everything that I've been, all these in, like these theoretical things that have existed very well in words, I have to find ways to grapple with in face-to-face -face interactions. And um, it's not easy. <laughs> so, Everyone that we interview, we ask them to bring us a show and tell because when I was a kid, it was something that I really loved doing, yeah. bringing shit. And it was always like really inappropriate shit. Like, <laughs> I, oh, I had some inappropriate ideas, but I exactly. blasted it up for you today. Just <laughs> terrible stuff. And I thought, this is an excellent opportunity. For, for me to ask adults to just bring something cool. interesting to share. Uh, so what did you bring? Well, I brought my, these are my, I don't know, gin, ginger, ginger um, sewing scissors. But yes. these, these are for, this is for fabric. Um, my new show, Wong Street Journal, I sewed my entire set. In using fabric to create like a digital world was just to sort of close the gap between right. the analog and digital. Bit. Yeah, <laughs> analog, exactly. A lot of the fabric went through these scissors. Sewing is something I've done in the last 10 years and it's been very empowering for me as someone <laughs> who always felt like you had to buy things for right. people. And, and as more and more stuff is manufactured overseas by people that you never meet, I think it's really incredible to be able to create something with my own hands and labor and time. And passion. So, wow, that's, that's so this. awesome. And this is, I put fabric only because apparently if you cut anything else with it, you dull your scissors, you dull your scissors. Yeah. Great. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks for watching another episode of The Third Space. You know what to do. Subscribe, follow us, like us, share our video. And also, if you know of any interesting people that you think we should talk to that are here in the Bay Area or passing through the Bay Area, please leave a comment in the comment section. All right, see you at the next Thursday. Thanks.